hope I live. I hope I live. She's coming down on me. Here it comes. I'm getting behind the car. It's uh, incredible. If you want to know where that little boy is today, check the video chapters. Let's get started. 9-11. Two numbers and one date that yield so much meaning and bring about so many difficult and absurdly detailed memories. I remember how the whole day played out. I was seven in the second grade and we went around the room to express our thoughts. I didn't have very many. I remember rather distinctly that I said something along the lines of, not only that, but rest in peace, Aliyah. It just felt like a back to back hit. Boom. Childhood up in smoke. That and I also remember that glitter came out the same day. The early 2000s. It was a strange time. I didn't know what terrorism was, or at least not to that capacity. It totally changed the world at large. How we travel, how we view our government, how we view acts of international terror on that scale, and the fact that they could reach our shores. In the middle of reading to a class, President Bush was alerted of an attack on the World Trade Center in New York. The last big moment of terror that I remember was Columbine. But this was no Columbine. Even pop culture latched onto it, although some depictions seem to have strangely been ahead of the curve. It seemed the perfect catalyst for the U.S. military to go to war for oil with the false threat of weapons of mass destruction this mysterious MacGuffin to find in some cave. It was at that time that Disney brought kids and random pop stars to musically instill hope in the form of messages like, proud to be an American, kumbaya, we are the world type songs, you know, songs about togetherness after tragedy. And it didn't go away. That tragedy, a long list of names came out the next year when I was in third grade and everyone was combing through to see if any potential relatives were on it. Some of them found very many. Everyone had a different narrative as to what they saw in the clouds and the omens brought about from them. Some saw the devil in the dust and others believed the stories of angels and the former firefighters who showed up to help and didn't actually exist. The harrowing imagery of people jumping from buildings because they thought that was a better fate than being crushed under a collapsing building still traumatizes me to this day, and thus begun my newfound desensitization to death being broadcast on live television. <laughs> Social ramifications stuck with us too. Suddenly, a terrorist had a look. For every one of those 3,000 lives lost, it seemed like several thousand more were scapegoated in acts of misdirected hate, senseless anger. It solved absolutely nothing. You can't exhume bodies to honor them with your Islamophobia. That's not how that works. Suddenly, every practicing Muslim in America was advocating for Sharia law to be the only law and indoctrinating others into Al-Qaeda. Our sense of security was promised by Homeland Security under the conditions that we would likely be treated as a threat, a threat to our own safety. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And I'm trying as hard as we can to get back home. Traveling was a lot less strict before, but now we don't even really question it. We just got used to it. 
like most government policies forced onto us, this was one we took pretty passively because, again, it was for our safety. It was almost a social experiment to see how easily we could all comply after being shocked by terror. It feels a bit familiar, but this was not a pandemic. This was a full frontal assault of retaliation on a nation whose government treated regions like conquest and people like chess pieces. It was only a matter of time before the disgruntled retaliated. Extremist groups are fostered by extreme situations and they dub anyone who is connected to their enemy's government an enemy by proxy, even its citizens. And anyone who is of their country or group but not their mindset is a traitor. So not even other Muslims were safe from this. This black and white thinking and split ultimatum mentality is exactly mirrored by the US. Take out anyone and make the target larger and larger to justify the casualties that lie outside of war. This was a 21st century crash course of modern imperialism and the consequences of creating enemies through relentless antagonization. Look out your window. Just another Tuesday. Take a picture next to the pretty towers. You didn't come all this way to not see them. The eighth wonder of the world tied with the Empire State Building and the Statue of Liberty. Look how beautiful. So much of the chaos was documented by civilians just living their lives, playing with their cameras, vlogging, if you will, totally unbeknownst to the explosion by him in what looks like a near-perfect timing of a photo, Austin Sanson was photographed just as smoke from the towers filled the sky. He showed up on Reddit in 2014 to explain that it was indeed a real photo and that he was the boy in it. He even returned a few years later to recreate the picture in front of the One World Trade Center as it was being completed. Austin and his mother Susan sat down with Billy from Under Understood podcast and opened up about the moment the photo was taken. I doubt any other sighting of the towers is as unique as this one. That's for the episode. Uh, could someone describe this photo? Oh, wow. We're looking at a photo of a, a kid uh, and he's standing on, I think it's probably uh, the walkway next to the West Side Highway in Manhattan. Um, and the, the camera is facing south right so we've got the kid in the foreground he's wearing um around his neck a pair of yellow binoculars um and behind him we can see down at the bottom of manhattan the twin towers are on fire this is just really odd because uh i i don't know i have a lot of questions about what's going on here uh it's unnatural looking my name is austin sanson and i live in tribeca which is in the lower west side of manhattan and this is a picture of me on 9-11 I was four years old and the picture was taken alongside the West Side Highway that morning. I have the actual photo, which I will post a picture of when I get home. For all of you doubting whether this is real or photoshopped, I promise you that it is sadly very real. And then he said, for all those who thought it was fake, here you go. This is me with one of the original photos printed. I also have the negatives somewhere. <coughs> so Austin and sorry, I didn't get your name. Susan <coughs> Lyle. Billy. 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 Susan. Y-A-L. Got it. So again, Austin brought his mother, Susan, who is actually a very successful costume designer for film and TV. She was very cool. Yeah. My name is Susan Lyle. I live in Tribeca. I'm a costume designer. And I am the photographer of the 9-11 photo that brought us all here today. Right. And I'm the subject, as the sign. <laughs> <laughs> So they live in Tribeca, just a few blocks from where this photo was taken, uh, supposedly taken. This is the proof from the negatives. So there's minuscule prints in line showing you what was contained on the roll. I have had this photograph duplicated a number of times, and hence the negatives are just somewhere out of my grasp at the moment. But... Here is the actual photo of the day, on the day. Do you mind if I hold the photo and look at it? Wow, yeah, okay. So this is the exact photo. 
right. that I saw shared online. <laughs> so this image will be on our website as well, but this is in 2011 on the 10 year anniversary of September 11th. This is a photo of Austin as a young teenager in the exact same spot. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. 